Good afternoon. Okay, we should probably get started here because we only have 25 minutes. Hello. Cool. So, hi, I'm John Hobson. I'm a senior research manager at Blizzard. Um, so, this is going to be a fishbowl debate. So, there's not going to be a lot of sitting down in your chairs, hopefully. So, what we're going to do is we have five seats up here. We're going to have four of them filled at any given time by members of the audience. If you have something you want to say in the debate, come up and sit in one of the empty chairs. You cannot leave the chairs until you've said your piece. So you are trapped until you say your thing. Um, if, if all the chairs are filled, you're welcome to come up and tap somebody on the shoulder when they're not talking and uh, kick them out. But the idea of this is the population of the debate is going to sort of rotate. So this is in the set panel. Uh, hopefully we will be able to rotate through. And if you have a question, there's not going to be a question section at the end. If you want to ask a question, you'll have to get up here and actually do it in person. So I'm going to request that we have uh, four seed people from the audience who want to start, have strong opinions on this topic. What is the topic? The topic? Oh. <laughs> Didn't your people read the program? Come on. OK. The topic today is return on investment in user research. Is how do we measure how we are effective and, how, and prove that this was worth it? <laughs> how do you prove that your studies are worth it, that your program is worth it, that your salary is worth it? How do you prove this research is valuable? Can I have four volunteers, please, from the audience who would like to speak? I will start drafting people, I swear. Okay. Do it. Ian. What else we got? Yeah. Okay. I have one thing. Oh, excellent. I have my four. One thing. Though. Sweet. Okay, so we have, thank you, brave gentlemen. We have uh, two microphones, so please do pass the microphones back and forth. I will donate this one in a sec. So. I want to start. Do you want to start? I'll, 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 I'll start. Excellent. <laughs> the short answer is you can't prove anything in, in the, like, uh, empiricist, uh, isolating the variable and, you know, like, Truth of the capital T, positivist sense, so don't even try. <laughs> so now, doesn't that make us giant hypocrites? Because I mean, our entire purpose is to say, we can, we can quantify how good you guys are doing. <laughs> I'm very comfortable being a hypocrite. I think it's one of the key aspects of human nature, so I embrace that. Own it, okay. Oh, go ahead, please. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was just going to say briefly, uh, something I've uh, recently had to argue, uh, not too hard, is uh, so if you are, you know, internal, especially internal games user researcher or user experience researcher, uh, look at how expensive third party uh, research is um, and use that, that dollar sign uh, as an argument to keep your position. I mean, because it is, uh, you, I mean, you are, like, you can literally be saving your companies millions of dollars in the long run by conducting your own recruitment, uh, conducting your own research and analysis, uh, running the playtest lab, whatever you do. Um, if they were to, to outsource that, it would be, it's, it's insane. So your, your job should be well secure after you, uh, you make that argument and you throw some numbers around. Like I should fight on the, of the third parties. We're not that expensive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I won't address that. I guess, you know, do check out how much a third party research actually is. Uh, it's not as much as you think. Um, I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I, I wasn't saying that. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's fine. Um, I was going to fight back to your original question with uh, a kind of counter question, which is even if you can work out how uh, much money it's saving you, how much user research is saving you, how do we get businesses to release that information? To, uh, to so that more game companies invest in it. So I know how much user research is worth as a result of being a third party, uh, and I can't tell you. I can tell you exactly how much I've increased retention in mobile games, I've increased revenue for, uh, I, in games as a service, you can release a live game, make changes, and then see the impact of those changes, like working on a website or something. So I, I know exactly how good user research is, and I can't tell any of you. So how do we address that problem as well? That's an extension of your question, John. Uh, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> By the way, the I first time you say anything, you have to introduce yourself and state oh. your affiliation. So, sorry, hello. I'm Seb. I work for Play Research in the United Kingdom. We are an con external consultancy doing games user research services. I, I have no idea. Oh, I, <laughs> I'm Ian. Sorry, I'm Ian Livingston uh, from EA. Uh, I have no idea how to answer that question. I want to answer <laughs> the one before, so I'll let someone else answer. Oh, I don't have anything to add right now. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so the the. The, the original question asks, how do we measure our value? One of the things that I like to, um, to point to when we're looking at the value that we add is um, inevitably as, as a group, we're there to help improve the overall quality of the games that we're, we're working on. And, and I think everybody would agree that if you improve the overall quality, if it's a more enjoyable experience, then inherently it's going to be uh, more successful, more valuable to some degree. And if we are 
working towards that effect, then we can start measuring the things that we are doing in our day to day that are uh, that are having a measurable impact. So things like identifying usability issues and then tracking those, and then identifying when those get fixed and uh, how frequently they get fixed versus uh, will not fixed or just excluded by the team. We can actually start looking at the overall impact that we're having on a production and start demonstrating that there's a degree of value that we, we are adding through the improvement of the overall quality of the games that we're working on. Uh, so, uh, Daniel at Big Fish, uh, Big Fish Games uh, in Seattle. So just to add to that, I think what you're talking about is, is sort of the, the value of benchmarking. So even if you're in like a, I'm primarily in a, a qualitative research role, uh, but I am finding it more and more pertinent to ensure that I can do some sort of quantitative measure or conduct some sort of surveys where over time I can prove the value of, of my research you know, uh, via numbers because people speak in different languages. Uh, and so th those are a much better sell than, than I am saying, I think I made the game better because you know, I gave you some friction points and told you to address those. Uh, so I, th I think benchmarking is, is a nice way to move forward um, and for everybody to be on the same page. Um, I'm actually gonna agree, um, but I go one step further and kind of push my radical anti-positivist agenda and that there's no such thing as truth in the world and you can't actually measure it. Um, it's the, basically, you need to have a really good understanding of who it is you're trying to tell your value or prove your value to, and what do they consider proof. So a lot of times when this discussion comes up, even just in, in UX in general and not games UX, people think about ROI in terms of, okay, how many sales or how much you know, spend can we associate with this? Turns out a lot of other domains never have to make that argument either. Right. So, um, you know, I don't hear people from QA or from marketing worrying about like, oh, my gosh, um, you know, how, how do we contribute to ARPU? Right. How can we uh, prove that we sold this many more units? Um, you know, they'll, they'll pick cherry pick stories that make them look good when it's convenient, but it's definitely not the standard of practice they're being held to. Um, what they have been able to do in those other more mature domains or domains that have been around for a longer time is they've been able to find out like these important like emotional levers that the people who have decision making power and the people like they need to justify their jobs to care about. And then that's what they lean on in terms of proving their value, if that makes sense. So I would say it is totally possible to prove it in a like social emotional sense, um, but then you have to do the work ahead of time to know, figure out what levers actually matter to the people you're trying to prove it to. Um, so I thought my answer was kind of obvious, so I figured these smart guys would get to it. Um, but have happy devs. Like, honestly, if my development team is singing my praises in, you know, obviously that's not happening, but if they were, if I was better at my job, and they were like super happy, what more do they need, right? Like if, if the creative director says like, hey, yeah, like this research really helped us make this decision, great. Like the designers, someone said like, there are other disciplines that don't need to make this kind of justification. The designers no, don't need justification to have a meeting to discuss design, right? Because they're just going to work and iterate and improve on their their stuff. No one needs to say like, well, you know, Joe Smith didn't contribute to the discussion. He's not worth having in these meetings. Do we really need more than that? Has anyone been asked for more than that? I'm not nearly important enough to get asked that kind of question. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Elina Olila and I, I'm a cheap UX consultant. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> uh, actually, I, I'm, I'm just about to start the new project where it's got almost kind of scary. Uh, my client uh, has, a, has a large MMORPG game and they have a large amount of quantitative stats and they know exactly where the player, players are dropping out. So. Where I come to the picture is I help them with, with qualitative user research. And now I'm, of course, worried if my recommendations are not good enough, the stats are not going to change. So I think there's going to be a very clear measurement if the, the money invested in the project has been worth it. So both a great place to be in. There's going to be a very clear indicator. But at the same time, um, yeah, I got to succeed. Do you want to be more combative? <laughs> Sorry. I'm Tom from Xbox, not being combative. But um, to tag on to, to some of that is, I, as a research manager, one of the things I get to do is push the pain a little bit. So instead of trying to cover 10 areas, you know, kind of this deep, 
we try to cover five or six areas pretty deep so that the other two or three groups that aren't getting our services or don't get enough attention will be clamoring for it. So you kind of have that supply and demand. Where I found in the past when you cover everybody, they're all kind of happy and then they're not usually asking for more. But you can build better case studies and build better examples of like, oh, if I go work with you for the next two months, I can do all of this that then other people are going to be clamoring for and help pay for and help get budget for. But you have to kind of give them a little bit of that pain and kind of hold it back a little bit. I'm Patrick. I'm with Maggot Associates. I've been at Warner Brothers, so I'm a, a filthy bottom feeding vendor, but I have actually been a contributing member of society in the past. Um, I mean, for vendors, it's super easy. If people come back and do more work with you, then you have proven your worth. Easy peasy. Um, but I think it's the, the thing that I'd like to push back on is the idea that other groups don't have to meet ROI. It's so baked in for design team. You are meeting your ROI or not because you get to make another game or you don't. Your team is dissolved at the end of the project or it's picked up and you're making another game. We're so far removed, and I know a lot of you have heard me uh, discuss this in some way, shape, or form over the last couple of years. We're so far removed from that immediate decision-making process of making the game, that we're a support group that helps make the game, that it's easy to look at that ROI, does another game get made? And I think that's really where we should be thinking of ourselves as more like the design team, more like the producers, more like the folks who have a very simple ROI. How did the game do? And that can be tough because we aren't the designers. We aren't actually in there making the game. We aren't making those key decisions. But that's still, at the end of the day, where our jobs are going to come from and where we, I think, should be finding our, our real overall joy is how does that game that we work on actually look at the end of the day when it's in players' hands. Also, vendors are super important. Really reasonably priced. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, the overall quality of the game, but there's so many factors that play into that overall quality. Because like, they were already thinking about changing that feature before I tested it. And yes, I pushed in one direction, but maybe they would have anyway. I mean, how do you draw the line on craving credit for that? Uh, well, if I worked on it and it went well, then obviously all the credit you can. And that actually, I think, reasonably goes to managers on in-house teams more than anything else is looking for those victories. And there's a legitimate point towards established disciplines have gotten good at finding wins and promoting those internally and finding problems and using those as learning opportunities, but not promoting them externally. But also every team is looking at the overall project and saying, we worked on this, this was a win for us and not hobbling themselves. I don't think it goes, I don't think it's up to individual researchers or research teams to shoot themselves in the foot with claiming credit for how something went because it's possible it could have gone really well. It's also possible it could have gone horrifically worse if you hadn't been involved. Um, I think it's a pretty pretty easy claim if someone looked you at the eye across the table and said, did you help make this better? And you'd feel comfortable saying yes. Write that down. Put that on your ROI. And if you'd feel uncomfortable, uh, don't. So the other, there's also the flip side of that. Um, and I'll stop talking at my own panel. But um, there's a flip side that, like, I've made recommendations that were wrong. For example, the, the famous one that I've copped to is I was against the Halo 2 matchmaking system. I said, no, we should do a different me method, not the one they shipped with. And the one they shipped with did great. So now am I in debt? Do I have to work off that amount of bad recommendations before I'm valuable again? I mean, do we, should we also take credit for our mistakes as well and debit ourselves? <laughs> I'll take one more swing here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think there is an ROI to just, there is a reality to you're better off, especially in creative industry, working with people who when something goes wrong aren't looking for a fire escape but are looking for a fire extinguisher. And I think that especially for the creative side, everyone is going to have to go through that at some point. Everyone is going to fight tooth and nail and realize they're on the wrong side of that fight. Uh, and being able to acknowledge it and move on is really important. But also acknowledge, yeah, you're down some cachet with people. Next time you just go, oh, don't don't worry, I have data. They go, yeah, you had real good data. And we almost didn't ship the matchmaking system. Um, I, I uh, worked a lot on uh, Mortal Kombat and just made absolutely no good recommendations on Mortal Kombat because I'm terrible at fighting games. But I did my level best with the data we had. And I think it's better to acknowledge that and then work with that team more closely and earn those points back as opposed to demanding people pretend that you're omniscient. Uh, so hi, I'm Andrea Appy. I'm a senior user researcher at Scopely. We do mobile games. So on the subject of taking credit for things, we've had some success with that just because they were things that were very much 
things that we did. Um, <laughs> So we had one game where they gave us a sprint and one release, and they just made UX changes like that were based on research, and the metrics went up. So that was very clearly like, hey, this is, this is something we did. This is us proving out our ROI. Um, and in another case, it was a similar situation, um, but it was like more of an A-B test. So it was like, OK, so we are making these changes based on the research. We're putting this into the game. We're going to A-B test it oh my god, all the metrics are great on the bucket with all these changes. So that's something if you can get your development teams on board with that, I think it might be, we're in a better position with that since we're an integrated design and research team. So we're working very closely with the UX designers as well. Um, but yeah, if you can convince your development teams to just make some UX changes based on what you did, then it's easy to say like, hey, look, we were responsible for this. <laughs> Is this a thing we do, though? Oh, oh sorry, right. Uh, Matthew White, PlayStation, data science guy. Um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, is this, is this a thing we really do, though? I mean, to me, this just sounds like the conversation earlier about imposter syndrome, right? Like, I don't, at no point in my current job or my previous job has anybody ever cornered me and said, what's your ROI, pleb? Like, that, is, that has never happened to me. I mean, I'm, I'm not, this is not, I'm quite young at this, so I mean, this is not a, you know, incredulous question. I mean, he wanted me to be combative, so I'll be combative. Like, what? <laughs> Realistically, you know, when we do our work, um, and by the way, you're, for those of you gawking, being like, what's the data guy got to do with anything? I, I, I mind user data. It, it, so I, I at least know somewhat what I'm talking about. I mean, you let Jordan in here. Anyway, um, so the punchline that I'm trying to drive at here is that uh, when we do our best work, we're providing designers, developers, etc., with something that's a little better than a hip shot. Right, like I mean, you know, a designer who's been working for a hundred years—well, not that long, you know, a long time—has intuition to certain things that we would maybe have to help indies and things like that with, or new people. Um, so we're making someone who's really, really good even better. You know, like we're not a great warrior; we're a great blacksmith. You know, like they're going to come to us because the sword is consistently sharper and better. But nobody, you know, in maybe real life, that might be your therapist or like your career counselor or something, someone that knows a bit about stuff and can dig data and give you some recommendations. And whether you take them or not is ultimately up to you. But I don't think anybody corners a therapist and says, like, how many utils of mental health did you dole out to people? It just doesn't seem like a reasonable way to think about ourselves or even count ourselves. Um, I, I think when we're coming from a place where you know I was the only researcher at Scopely for a bit and now we've grown out to having five people and we would like to have more people since right now I'm sharing an associate with Jordan and would like yeah. Jordan to have his own associate like we do have to prove out our ROI you know if I I know that Raina's great but I have to you know prove, prove to somebody else that that we're all great and you should have more of us so they give us the the money to hire more people I think that's a really good point because we we're, I think everyone's kind of dancing around the idea that we're implicitly valuable. Like there's obviously valuable information that we're providing, uh, results that we're giving, that it's improving the product or the games or whatever. Um, but there is an explicit value that we need to look at. Like how, how much should you invest? Sure. Do you, should you put in a million dollars into a new lab? How quickly will you get that back in in you know, improvements in the game. Uh, how many researchers should you, you put in? How much should you spend on each session? How many players are gonna give you that, that back, right? And I don't, you know, this is stuff I, I try and look at every now and then, and I try and keep that cost low, but um, I'm not sure if it's something that we're, we're looking at carefully. There's, there's always someone 100% checking your ROI. And it may just be that it never crosses your line until you find out that there's another position available or there's one less position available, but there's absolutely someone always checking ROI. And, and you, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and, it's finance. And <laughs> to, to your point, it's, it's, not, it's not malicious, it's not bad, it's that someone has to look through and go, what are we gonna do to get the best game out? What are we gonna do to get the most games out? We're gonna do to ensure that there's still a job for a team once this game is out. And you can, you can ship a game without us. You can't ship a game without a sales team. You can't ship a game without a producer. You can't ship a game without an artist, an engineer, a designer. There's a long list of people who you have to have to ship the game and an equally long list of people who have very valid reasons to be on the team that you can exist without. So not only do we have to prove ROI, but we're coming from a place where lots of people have gotten by 
without our specialization. No, and I agree. And I just want to be very clear that I, I understand, you know, to some degree when, when we have hiring and, you know, we need a new person, I do have to, to some degree, justify that I'm going to give that value back to the game. But um, I just want to be very careful that we don't, like, give a mindset of, especially to the junior folks, like that, that there's some constant race to validate that you are worth being present in your company. Also, I have no ulterior motive. Vendors are wonderful people. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so I, I missed the original question so if I talk nonsense just ignore this uh, I'm Graham from Player Research uh, we are an external vendor um, so this ROI thing is interesting um, as someone who deals with a lot of the game industry um, ROI people seem to jump immediately to a quantitative number ROI is it better I'd like to turn it into a qualitative question and the thing that we don't advertise at all never not once ever and we're fully busy. And what it comes down to is word of mouth. So if you turn ROI into a qualitative question, and the thing is, was it worth it? When people recommend us, we get most of our work from someone else saying, player research did this job in our game, you should hire them. So and they don't ask how much more money did they make you, they ask you, was it worth it? It's a qualitative question. They don't justify it with a number. So maybe you need to think about ROI differently, perhaps. Um, one example was a studio, a small mobile indie studio who had to pay the rent that month. And instead, they were told to hire us. That's a pretty big decision, right? Do we, <laughs> do we stay in the office for another month? Or do we hire this set? This, uh, was that? They are still in business, right? Yeah, they are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John, for the question. They have grown. So they, they did hire us. They were featured by Apple. Uh, they went down, they got millions of downloads. Um, but that was a really tough decision for them. And the only thing they asked was, should I hire these guys? So my just point what I'm trying to say is why do you immediately jump to a number for ROI? That's the easiest thing, it's the easiest thing in the world. When well, we do have examples of that that we can't talk about, obviously, as Seb said. But that's easy stuff. We did this research. We doubled your revenue. I have examples like that. That's fine or tripled, whatever it is. The harder thing is justifying it. Why should I do use the research? So that's my thought. So just to bring it down to my level instead of you know Ian or Graham's level. Um, justifying the time on your dev team too is a, a problem that I have more difficulty with because my devs are really busy. Like if I, there's no way that I can get a, a two hour meeting with my creative director unless it's like the world is on fire. So another thing to think about is how do we justify the time that our developers, our partners spend working with us? I do that by hopefully doing good work building goodwill and answering their questions, but I don't know if other people have different strategies for that. Thoughts? I was going to go back to a different point, so maybe this is bad timing, but I'm Nikki Crenshaw. I'm a PhD candidate, so I'm not actually in the industry, but I have thoughts about this. Um, and this is more of like an ethics question where you guys are talking about determining value based on ROI, and I think that's kind of a dangerous path to go down when you start to equate anybody's worth, really, like in terms of the monetary value that they're able to contribute rather than some other factors. And so if we're using ROI as the main thing to consider, you know, are you worthwhile to this company? Um, is there other stuff that we're maybe ignoring um, or overlooking? Because a game being quality doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to create all of the money in the world. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you guys have thoughts on that as people in the industry. I'll pick a fight. Um, <laughs> hopefully, if you're in the industry, you're getting paid a salary, and that salary is a fixed number. And if you do good work, that salary goes up. So you have been assigned, I am worth this many dollars to the company. I think that's just kind of an inherently required system to measure, to some degree, the value that you bring to a company. Right? You're not going to get hired at $150,000 with no experience if people with 10 years of experience are getting paid that. Yeah, I mean, and there's also replacement. That's sort of like that, that headcount could have gone to an engineer. That headcount could have gone to another designer. And there's a value of amount of stuff they could have put into the game that you didn't. That that, did, that didn't happen because you were polishing what was already there. So that. Yeah, I mean, it, there's, it's always a trade-off. In a business, it's always going to be a trade-off. You, you have to look at it and say, is it, is it worth it? Is it worth the investment in this? Is it worth the continued investment in, in what we're doing? Is it going to make it better, right? Whatever it is, is it the, the quality? Is it, is it you know, in, Q, in QA's situation, is it, is it a more stable experience? Like, how, how is that going to improve the game for the players in a, in, a, in a way that's going to be good for the business? 
So we, are, we have one minute left, so we'll have Mike round us out. Here. I, I'm Mike Amateur. I'm a psychologist at uh, Valve. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. Um, <laughs> so, because uh, I'm a communist. Uh, I, I think it, it's, <laughs> it can be very difficult to assign a monetary value to anything that we do. Um, so of course we want to convince people that we are worthwhile and useful and that we are contributing and that ideally it has a positive impact on the money that the products and services that our companies create results. But the goal is not to improve somebody's RI. The goal is to make better decisions and the hope is that those better decisions will lead um, to more money for the company, right? So like if we're optimizing to increase money because I think I can focus on this aspect of the game and it's gonna be visible to these people and it might get me a 5% increase in salary, well, that's one way of doing things. Like a better way, a more productive way, at least for like myself as a researcher, as a person, as a person, as an employee at the company who wants to contribute is to actually focus on the things I think are most important, um, the problems in the game that are gonna be most apparent and to try and fix them. I'll get better and ideally the games will get better as well. So I would much rather focus on, um, yeah, I guess what I think the, the problems we see in the game um, as opposed to what I think is the most visible thing that somebody is going to reward me for. Um, like the game will be better and I will be better and the company will be better as well. I don't think we disagree. Like I think, you know, as an individual, I want to make it. I want to make what I'm working on better, right? But from a business standpoint, there's there's a calculation that has to be looked at. Like how much more? Yeah. I think it's it's. I do think we totally agree. I think it's like an ideology perspective, like where it's. Um, and you know, this is easy for me as somebody who's not like working in the industry right now to say like, oh, well, ethically, should we think about people in this way? And you guys are like, well, there's actually solid numbers that we have to meet because this is the way capitalist societies are structured. Um, and so, yeah, I agree um, from a different perspective. You all agree. Yeah. And, on, and on that note, we are out of time, but thank you all very much for participating. Thank you everyone who was brave enough to come up. I'll hand it over to the next.